blossom that you see now on the blackthorn uh, will shortly turn into dark green hard fruit and by winter time there'll be beautiful ripe black berries uh, called sloes. So on the great fields, the woodland pasture that was traditionally the parkland, we have an awful lot of ancient oak trees which are sadly dying from old age or also from possible drought. This is called a stag's horn tree uh, because the top of the tree dies back and it resembles a stag's horn. We like to leave these on the estate as they're great uh, refuge and habitat for insects, beetles, birds, hibernating bats and the like. So this champion oak tree here in the woodland pasture is an absolutely brilliant example of how an English oak tree can grow if it's not shaded or surrounded by other trees and open pasture. One plant that's very typical on woodland pasture is mistletoe. Mistletoe is spread, uh, the berries and the seeds are spread by birds going from tree to tree as they fly across the pastoral area. So here we've got mistletoe growing on hawthorn tree. The hawthorn sadly is slowly falling over. If you look down towards the back of Turkey Brook in the silhouette you can see every ball or lump that's growing on that tree is actually a mistletoe plant. So catkins are produced on plants that use the wind for cross-pollination. So the pollen is produced within the catkin and you can see here the catkins are all being pushed out and hanging down low. This is so the wind will pass through, suck out the pollen which will float on the air, come to the next tree and will land on the next catkin and therefore you have fertilisation. So, so growing here the tree is ivy. Ivy is one of our native species, a native climber. It produces flowers which then form the blackberries which are very good for wildlife. The birds come to eat them and love them. Yeah. It's a typical vegetation community that you'd find on bank sides. There's the dead nettle, which is in the Lamium family. If you pull off the flowers, which are white, and squeeze it, it produces a very nice nectar and children often will suck that up, it tastes delicious. That's the dead nettle, because it doesn't hurt you. Growing behind it, however, is the stinger nettle, and that will hurt you if you don't have calloused hands like I do. So here's a little clump of dock plants. If you were unfortunate enough to be stung by a stingy nettle because the leaf is cold, quite waxy, you can rub that nice cold leaf around where you've been stung and it takes away the sting. So on the estate we have a policy where a tree is dead. If it's not going to be a danger to the public, we leave it as dead wood because it's wonderful habitat. All the holes you can see here are actually where beetle grubs have emerged as they're maturing and living inside as a grub. They mature into a kind of pupa and then they hatch out and this is where they emerge from. And we have an awful lot of stag's horn beetle on the estate. And this area is known as the pond groves. If you consider the medieval manor, the lord of the manor would have the right to a free fishery and that meant that he could produce lakes or ponds for fish. Now that, wasn't, that was important not only because people like to eat fish, but under Christian rule there were three or four days of the week when you couldn't eat red meat. So the only food you would eat that was meat would be fish. And it was the lord of the manor who owned the fish, and it was the peasants that would look after them, feed them, and then they would be sold. Now Rhododendron pontigum is from China. Uh, this is the original form, it's not a cultivar. And you can see that as actually there's no ground cover plants growing underneath it. There are several reasons for this. Firstly, it's evergreen, so it's taking all the light, so hardly any light comes to the ground level. And secondly, the plant produces a toxin, a poison, which poisons the soil and stops other plants from germinating. This is why this plant is classed as invasive and it's destroying our local ecology because we no longer have the basis of the food web that we need for all the other plants and animals. Now, although it may look nice when it comes in flower, it's possible that that poison is also in the nectar and so that could be killing off insects, including bees. So here you can see the rhododendron has colonised the entire island. It's filling up all the space from the ground level through to the mid canopy, so it's ousted all the other native species. So the ground cover plant you see in front of us is lesser celandine. It grows all around the estate and very typical indicative of, of old woodland, not to say ancient woodland, but old. It actually grows almost like a small tuber or potato under the ground and then the, the growth comes up in February, March time, one of the earliest flowering spring flowers, and you get these lovely yellow flowers all over it. Now yellow at this time of year is a very popular flower colour, mainly because insects who are coming out from hibernation at this time of year can see the ultraviolet light 
which we actually see as yellow, but there are patterns in ultraviolet, which things like uh, bumblebees can easily see. So most of our spring flowers are often white or yellow for that reason. In front of us there's a beautiful mature lime tree. You can see the main trunk and then coming off the trunk are a large number of smaller stems. Now the way that lime grows naturally is to have numerous suckers growing from the base. So this plant is a known common name of butcher's broom. It's nationally very rare but on this estate it's quite uh, a, a frequent occurrence. It's called butcher's broom because it's actually very hard, almost like a holly, and butchers would cut it and use it as a broom on their meat tables. So if you imagine the medieval market, all the muck, the flies and everything else, good old butcher's broom would keep the flies off your meat. So all the hornbeam seedlings which have grown around the area probably came from this mother tree. And this was a huge pollard. It may look like three separate trees, but actually if I step in the middle, this was one enormous tree. And slowly each branch has fallen back and tilted. And for centuries, this has been maintained and managed as a pollard. So we're now at Crater Pond. This is the favorite haunt of our beautiful gray heron. You see to the back shore there. And it's also one of our breeding ponds for the great crested newt, which obviously is an endangered species. And we're doing everything we can to ensure that we retain the breeding population.